Hopefully, I don't need to mute it. So they just have to attend seminars? They have to attend seminars. It's a one unit class um, each quarter. And I think like a master's student might have to do three quarters of it. Mm -hmm. And a PhD might have to do six or eight or something like that. Oh, OK. We have it like two credit hours, which is two semesters. Mm -hmm. and then they have to write a two page summary of what they learned, at least from two of the seminars. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't have to write anything. <laughs> 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 it's better that you don't have to read at the end, right? Yeah. Okay, let's start. Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Today we have uh, Professor Ala Kawi from the University of Merced. She's a professor in the mechanical engineering department. She works in uh, various manufacturing processes and uh, sustainable manufacturing, in particular uh, sheet metal design and engineering for automotive and device. And today she's going to enlighten us on uh, some aspects related to that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So today my talk will be about systematic understanding and modeling of origami sheet metal folding for enhanced mechanical properties and topological reconfigurability. And before I go and dive in and, and, and slides, I want you to just to note that there's two different entities on, on the title. There's mechanical properties and then there's topological reconfigurability. So the topological re reconfigurability is basically the, the challenge from any origami structure that we had. And then the mechanical properties is basically for the structures that we already know in mechanical engineering field. So to tackle this problem, I, I, will, I will go through um, some steps to, to, to see how we can optimize the parts for this intent. So as an overview, my lab is integrated design and manufacturing. And um, the area of it is we have to integrate the, try to integrate the design and the manufacturing processes and their effect on the design of the part and how to package all of that in intelligent systems, basically knowledge-based systems and expert systems that can you give, that a, a designer can I give a CAD model and then um, the output will be, this feature is going to be produced because the manufacturing process we selected is um, incapable of producing the, uh, this. So in order to go from this length of the cycle, we need to build a lot of knowledge and expertise in order to, to code it into an algorithm or a, a program that can tell us. So we're still in this phase currently. So today, today we'll be talking, my talk will be designed for manufacturing with a specific for origami sheet metal uh, folding parts. So what's origami sheet metal folding, right? So we all heard about origami, paper origami, the famous rabbit one page um, that uh, a person can fold into a rapid, sh a rapid uh, shape. Uh, however, in origami, the expectations is not that complex uh, as a, I'm creating a curvatures of a rabbit or a, a, a more complex shapes. So in this essence, we're trying to create component uh, parts uh, for mechanical loading capabilities, but instead of creating it in stamping or other manufacturing process, we're trying to fold it. So the folding comes that we can use one single flat pattern, basically lay all these faces of the part, and then try to fold them into 3D part that's intended, the final geometry that we require. So as you can see here, that this is a floor panel of a vehicle. This is an underbody. So you don't see it basically in, in a vehicle. It's covered with um, carpet and leather or any type of cloth material. So this actually, this part was folded from one single pattern. So we have a flat sheet, and then we fold it into different shapes until we create the final shape of the um, interior vehicle um, underbody that you can see. So in order to enable folding, we need to create what's called material discontinuities. So these material discontinuities can be in, in terms of removal of the material. So we basically remove um, material along the bend line, or it can be stamped. So any type of degradating the material along the bend line is, a is enabling the folding process. 
So what's examples of, of origami sheet metal folding, and I will refer to it as OSM from here, is that we can create it for structures under body. So we can create it for floor panels, we can create it for a shock tower, or a cross member structure um, underneath the hood. Um, so these three structures, not necessarily currently um, with the origami sheet metal folding, they are um, easy to, to, to be performed, um, but we need to verify more about how to convert from the 3D to 2D. So if I give, for example, this part for a designer to stamp it or to create it from sheet metal, this will not be a one flat pattern. They need to be sliced and then welded, spot welded or um, welded into an essence of a uh, final 3D geometry. However, in origami, I, can, I have methods or a way to create that. However, in order to go from the 3D geometry to the 2D, this is the topological uh, entity where I need to investigate further. So why origami is, is very important. You know, sheet metal forming has been here for years, um, mass production, um, vehicle companies, or most of the people who work on, on sheet metal forming is basically comfortable with stamping. Um, there's no any a new, um, I would say, challenges that the origami um, uh, doesn't, um, face compared to the stamping. However, if we, if we apply the OSM in terms of its process component-wise, it can consolidate parts. So instead of having this floor panel chopped into different parts and then welded, it, we can create it from one single uh, flat pattern. The other thing is that it enables one piece flow. So because this is not a shape dedicated uh, process, we don't need to re-educate um, the machines. We just have the same part moved uh, as needed in the production line. The other thing is that, as I said, it's not shape dedicated, so we can eliminate the, the need for uh, dies and presses that takes the inverse shape of, a, let's say, a door or a, of a hood or a hood of a vehicle, and it changes whenever we're changing the model of the vehicle. And the other thing is that we can sometimes create features that's not necessarily possible in sheet metal forming, uh, stamping specifically, but it depends on the need. So if we looked at the process overall, like where we origami has merits or potential. So um, this is the, the process flow of a stamping uh, sheet metal in, in, in traditional manufacturing process. So we go with the rolling or milling of the um, sheet metal. We have chemical treatment for the sheets, forming with high pressure, high tonnage presses and um, dyes. We have to store the shaped um, sheet metal, which takes a lot of storage inventory space. We do adhesive bonding to seal all of these um, different um, connecting lines. We do spot welding, build, uh, body build, and then we do the thermal cure, which is giving coats, different coats to the vehicle. And then at the end, the body goes to the assembly um, with different powertrain or suspension and so forth. However, in origami, we can, the first two steps are the same. That we don't need forming processes anymore. We just need blanking or laser cutting, water jetting just to create the MDs or to create the overall shape of the flat pattern. And then we create the flat pattern. We, we can store it, minimize the storage uh, space because this is just flat sheet. We use it whenever we need it. We can move up the thermal cure painting um, process um, up here. And then the challenge or the merit of this is that in this case, we need to um, do thermal cure for inclined surfaces and curvatures. However, in here, I'm just we're doing coating for a flat piece of sheet metal, which is less complex and less energy um, than the uh, um, curvature's thermal cure. And then we do the laser cutting features on, on for the bending lines. We fold the 3D shape into required shape, and then we still have some adhesive bonding and then uh, spot welding and then the assembly. So you can see in different, if we look in the context of different operation, we have merits for the OSM. So, if OSM is very good and cool, why we don't, why well, nobody actually already used it and apply it into a manufacturing process that's already there? Like, it's, this, it seems from all the presentation that I did so far, it's a good thing. It's an opportunity that nobody took. Um, so the, the, the only thing is that when we deal with origami principles, um, there's more limitations that we, we need to overcome before we can say, okay, this part can be um, put into a mass production and then um, go into a vehicle. So all of the science we built or researchers has built so far is that it, it either takes um, symmetrical entities or symmetrical geometries that's not necessarily useful in the vehicle applications or it, it doesn't um, comply or fall under the umbrella of the same thing we're doing as the rigid origami. So you can see that, for example, this is a metal shopping bag that's have been folded. However, 
um, these faces are glued to a cloth. So the deformation is actually on bending line is a cloth piece. It's not, it's not a metal piece. And then other, other applications actually doesn't satisfy the need of the sheet metal forming. Um, so if we want to apply full sheet metal forming in, in terms of origami, we have limitations in terms of the rigid origami, the thickness, adding the thickness, adding a material such as metal, and then the design requirements, the manufacturing process, and the geometry and topology. So it's not, it's not just folding a paper. We need to, to satisfy a lot of manufacturing and design indices in order to make it useful, useful in a production line or potential production line. So that puts me to a question that if I want to go put a research analysis for, the, for this components, it can be under three of these topics. So it's in terms of the design, how to go from the 2D transformation to the 3D and vice versa. How, what's the mechanical aspect of it? How we can evaluate the properties and the performance? And then the final one is the process-wise, um, how to can optimize the bending process and modeling of the, the process itself, and how to evaluate if this is a good process to, to go with or no. And then if we try to put this into a research question, the major question when I show you a, a mechanical component for a vehicle is that it's mechanical loading capabilities. Despite if it's design, despite if it's energy consumption, and despite of its uh, um, processes. So the, the, the safety uh, requirements of a vehicle is, is actually the highest demand in a vehicle design. So if this part is actually doesn't, the origami doesn't sustain any static and dynamic load, then it, the principle from the beginning, it cannot sustain, um, regardless of its energy saving and process improvement, it's not feasible for such application. So in order to answer this goal of can origami sheet metal forming, uh, sheet metal products um, structures bear mechanical loads. There's a two, two ways of, uh, of going through um, answering this question. The first one is the, to understand the model, the mechanical performance of SM structure, which is the mechanical aspect of all mechanical engineers can tackle. And then the other one, it comes from the origami, the, the topological reconfigurability of different faces. So to understand the topological re reconfigurability of uh, some structures. And these two tracks are mutually exclusive. So uh, they don't communicate basically. So if I proved that the topological analysis is good, that's not necessarily affecting the mechanical and so forth. However, at the end, they meet because in order to evaluate the mechanical components of SM, we need to look at the, both of this understanding and then generate the topological re reconfigurability of the parts. So in order to go to the 2D transformation to 3D, I will give you just an example of crash tower front model. So this is an, actually a design uh, uh, went into a vehicle. So um, you can see that we have two components. They are, there's a surface actually separating them, so they're not one piece. And then if we looked at part one and tried to, to fold it, there's a total of 29 flat patterns possible. So all of those you see here can be successfully folded to the part one. So 2D variation, but the, the 3D is the same, exactly the same. So that leads me to a question. As engineers, and if I'm, I'm in the design and I give you the 2D flat patterns, that 29, and I ask you, okay, choose one. You want to do me a, a prototype, which one should I choose? The lightest one. Huh? The lightest one. The, they are the same height, the same weight. Minimal folds. Minimal folds. What else? Um, World length, exactly. If I want to create 100 million of those, this flat pattern. Most contiguous, yeah. So the, the nesting efficiency, right? So this is a sheet metal forming. So it's a, how, how these lays on, um, on a uh, material. So before I, I go through the, the optimization indices, I want to just to show how, how we went from the 3D geometry into the 3, 2D flat pattern. And so there's actually a procedure to go through. So when we add thickness, you can find a lot of publications and papers that's uh, presented there for how to, to go from 3D and 2D. And there's a very uh, famous professor from Japan. Um, his name is Tashi. He's actually already created software that like you can put a CAD model, and then the CAD model can be transferred into flat pattern. However, the drawback of this is a zero thickness. So there's no thickness for the material. When you add thickness, everything change. So if I have a, two, a 3D geometry and I'm, I'm able to do boundary representation and topological extraction, so there's two, two information I can get from the 3D geometry. There's a, the, the geometrical information and there's the topological information. So if, we, if I come back here, 
All of these flat patterns has the same geometrical information, but not the same topological information. So in order just to isolate the topological information and analyze it, and then don't bother with the geometrical information because it's the same, it just um, makes the, comp the computation more complex. So the interesting theory about that is that we can represent the topological uh, uh, representation of graph representation, which is a very well known in, in networking science, like how to connect electricity to different areas and so forth, or how to make roads, or how to make, um, maybe industrial engineers um, know more about it, is how to make um, uh, deliveries between different cities and so forth. But it, it applies perfectly to the topological information. So once we extract the topological information and keeping the geometrical information aside based on the graph theory, we can transfer it into binary system, which is zero and one. So now I can not just graphical representation as nodes and links, I can have zeros and one, that means I can have a code computer that analyzes all of these different patterns without even bothering with the different shapes. And then in order to go through all different patterns, um, different patterns mean different connections in, in, this, in, in this context. So the graph theory have been developed many, many years. There are a lot of algorithms that already exist. The drawback of these algorithms is that, like we have the, what's called breadth first search, depth first search, and A star search, all of them generate single flat pattern. So there's no any comprehensive analysis. So as long as the, the computer finds one good path between all these nodes, it's fine. But for the flat patterns, I need to investigate all possible paths. Otherwise, I will not get all the flat patterns. So in order to do that, I developed an enumerating all minimum spanning trees and all enumerating all, um, all flat pattern algorithm, meaning that the, the code starts randomly whatever node and then goes from all different possible patterns, all possible paths that should be uh, concluded and listed. Okay, there's actually a missing slide, let's see. So before we, we go through that, um, I, I just want to indicate the computational complexity. So in, in networking, like, I can go to like one million nodes or, or more, depends on my network. And um, this is not all the time feasible in origami sheet metal folding. However, for these algorithms that we developed that we cannot basically apply uh, for networking applications. But for origami, it's fine because we will not have a one million face or 100 face connected to each other. So the number of faces actually is minimal in, in, in our application. So this is actually a feasible um, application for the algorithms we um, applied or we created. And then um, I'll just give, give you an overview actually where are, where are we. So we have a topological and uh, geometrical information in a CAD file or CAD design. We extracted the topological information. Based on the graph theory, we represented it into topological info, binary system. We developed a graph traversal algorithm. The graph traversal algorithm gives us a feedback or a output in terms of also binary system zero and ones. And then based, we add the um, shape rec recognition um, graphs. And then the final one is that here, we can add um, the geometrical info that we extracted back. So we end up with a geometrical flat pattern. However, there's a one tricky part between here and here. So the flat patterns can be, the topological results can be for the um, show, the shock tower that I show you, there can be more than 300 flat patterns. However, we end up with 29 only. So if I removed, if we looked at the topological results here, the topological result says which face is connected to which. There's no thickness, there's no dimensions, because the geometrical information is extracted, right? So if I told you this face is connected to this face without no, knowing any thicknesses, what will be the concern? The overlapping will be the concern, because when I add the geometry back, I cannot tell, I need to tell if, the overla if there's overlapping between faces, since the, now they have geometry information. So there's a, um, a, an overlapping detection algorithm has been developed in between these two, face, two phases. And then this topological um, overlapping detection cuts <laughs> down the results from 300 to 29. And now we have a valid geometrical flattening, um, flat patterns. All of them are possibly, um, can be folded to the um, final part. Okay, so that leads me to another question that we already answered. It's like n now it's number two, and number two had 30. And you can see that they have like 
weird shapes like this, this flat pattern, weird shape um, flat pattern that can be folded and welded to the final part. And then we need to optimize it and see which one um, is, is the bit, is best one, but not basically by manually going and calculating each flat pattern. We need a, a way of optimizing this um, in, in terms of not auto automatically done, not just by hand or by um, designer tuition, uh, intuition. So the design optimization ob objectives for design um, uh, matrices can be designed for manufacturing, designed for cost, and designed for assembly when we look at the origami sheet metal uh, parts. So optimality based on compactness. This has, this has matrices has been deployed based on design uh, for cost and manufacturability. So we're looking at the, basically the area of the flat pattern and how, how much uh, uh, material we waste. And based on the flat patterns, we can look at it in different, different contexts based on the needs. So we can look at the total length of cut edges. So this is reduces the blanking and the laser cutting of the blank if we're doing that. Uh, we, do, uh, we look at the large extent in X and Y direction. This is a major thing in OSM because if I'm creating a flat pattern that has seven or eight faces, it will be long and, uh, and wide. So in terms of reducing the material handling uh, requirement, then this needs to be optimized in some, in some certain extension based on the needs in the shop floor. And then we're looking at the material uh, basically enclosed in a, in, a, in a rectangle, and we're looking at the material percentage use of area prescribed, so how much I'm using from the material I'm, I'm, I'm cutting. So other thing is that when we take this into the mass production is optimality based on nesting. So if I'm having different flat patterns, the same copy of this over a sheet metal strip, what will be my savings and what will be my losses in terms of material um, loss? And this is a major thing in, in sheet metal manufacturing because the scrap, the, the uh, sheet metal roll costs a lot. But once the scrap material, even if it's not used, it's basically recycled for a very low cost. So it's, it's very important for the manufacturer to optimize the wasting material between the flat patterns to the minimum. So for this, we used a heuristic algorithm for nesting. Um, so nesting is not a new thing for sheet metal manufacturer. It has been there for years. Um, so for, for the flat patterns, um, we identified different parameters you can see here. And based on that, it, we can apply an algorithm that ca keep orienting the flat patterns in a certain width and uh, length of a strip. And the, the um, algorithm calculates how much material is in between and then try to optimize each time. And then the final one or the fourth one is uh, optimality based on line orientation. Um, the reason for that is that if we want to automate this process or make it on our mass production, we need a robot arm to do the folding. We don't need a person actually sitting on the uh, operator on a shop floor doing all the folding by hand or by hydraulic folds, um, hydraulic machines. So we need to look at how much manipulation and reorientation the robotic arm will take and minimize that. So in order to do that, we, we can um, create what's called orientation of bends metrics, and this is actually an optimization code that looks at the different orientation of the lines um, in X and Y. Currently, we have just X and Y, so we want to develop more in terms of we have, let's say that I have a bend line that's connecting this node and this node here. So what happens? How can I, we optimize this um, number of orientations. So the, the flat patterns that has minimal number of orientation in terms of bend lines wins in this um, optimization. And then the final one is optimizing built and welding costs. So we said that this process consolidate parts. That means it reduces the assembly processes and the cost associated with assembly processes. So we need to optimize the build, welding cost. And then the graph theory comes in handy here because there's only one parameter or one primary parameter can be identified when, when doing the algorithm of minimum spanning trees or basically the paths. So we can define the welding cost for each of the um, flat patterns based on the length of the weld. And then we can end up with a flat pattern that's um, optimized in terms of cost. So before I go, I go to, to this, when, when there's <coughs> a many, many optimization indices, that can be applied into uh, any context. There will be op competing optimization indices or optimization objectives. So currently, um, if we're looking at the, all di these different optimization uh, indices, 
they're not necessarily giving us the same flat pattern. So each optimization indices can end up with different flat pattern as an optimized. However, currently we, do, we don't have any um, mechanism to do multi-objective optimization for the flat patterns with the terms of what we know about it. Uh, but it depends on the needs of the designer. So if the, the maximum need is optimizing the welding cost, then this will be applied. If it's, for example, in the X and Y direction extent, then this will be um, the um, leading optimization um, objective. So we looked also at the bending or folding process. And, and the reason for that is that if we want to analyze the mechanical properties of the part and say of the OSM and say it actually saves energy and effect and so forth um, and complexity, we need to, to enable to evaluate the process. So currently what we looked at is the, a simple uh, 90 degrees bend with uh, material discontinuities. So we have a whipping die bending setup. That's a, a, a traditional bending setup and this is the closest to the fold. And then we have a bending without die. The, as you can see, you can see that both of them are s somehow similar, but the only difference is that the punch here is not carefully located. So it can be located anywhere along this um, extent of the bend line. However, in the whipping die, we need to carefully use the T plus G space, which is the, the distance between the blank holder or the die and the punch in order to enable the, the required radius uh, of the bend. And in sheet metal forming of OSM, is not, this is not necessarily um, required because the material discontinuities control where the bending will happen. So that reduces the force sig significantly. Um, the other thing is that the actual uh, process that imitates the OSM is that we have one single bend, um, single punch, or single support, actually it's not a, even a punch, and then we have, a, um, sorry, support, and then we have two punches, this basically um, folding the, the um, sheet metal into, um, from the two sides. And this has resulted with a minimal force too, from the two, uh, three. So the material discontinuities, we have a total of 12 now successful and feasibly can be uh, applied to OSM. And you can see that this is actually an, a very big uh, uh, scale to demonstrate. So some of those can be laser cut and some of them are material um, stamped. Um, however, if, if we looked at these 12 different MDs, and, and I just want to ask you, which one should I choose? This is a question that we ask ourselves, like which one we should choose, right? Which one is the optimized one? All of them in this case is material removal. So all of them are done by material removal process. So there's no any stamping in this case, it's assumed. So you can see that we have a simple ones. We have ones that's alternating um, the same one. And then we have um, um, ones with more complex shapes. And we have one with more curvature than the others. So in order to optimize the process, we need to, to pick one uh, MD that's optimized first. So that leads us to evaluating of the processes um, in terms of the strain resulted on the bending line first and go from there. So the best MD that has less strain on the bending line, then we will uh, take it to optimize the structure. So what we started is doing a simple bending die setup just to, to, to have a benchmark uh, reference line for our simulation. So the simulation was basically equivalent to the actual process of a whipping die. And then we, go, we went from there to simulate um, um, cases with having MDs and regular sheet metal forming. And then we tried to do, have different parameters of the MD and see what's the effect on the strain or the um, deformation along the bend line. So we have what's called ending arrangement for the MD. So we can have open end, which is in this case, that the material, the MD extend to the edges of the sheet metal and, some, and, and the closed it doesn't. We have sheet metal thickness and in this case we picked grade 16 and grade 14 sheet metal which is actually used for body in white of vehicle. This is a standard um, uh, sheets for the vehicle that's used. And then um, we created a, a curve to thickness ratio that, to be the same. We cut with the bending force, the stresses, um, edges to face engagement meaning that they interact or overlap after bending and then the spring back because these are the things, major things when we look at the sheet metal forming or sheet metal bending in this case. So you can see for the regular sheet metal, the, the force actually reduced significantly. Um, however, the stress is as, expect, as expected increased. So for this, this one, the closed, um, the closed MD uh, shape actually performed better. Um, however, for the spring back, 
um, we expected, we didn't expect this result. So the, um, the origami or OSM actually performed a little bit slightly better than the regular sheet metal in terms of the spring back. And all the bending is actually happened even between the MDs or along the MDs. So for, I will show you how as actually bending without a die means. So uh, even if this is actually shown as a, a, as a die, uh, punch, this is just a force. So it, it's not carefully located along the bending line um, to calculate or to create the bend. So it can be uh, created anywhere. So this is the MDs, and then this is the, where the, most of the stresses happen um, along the, um, the MD. So in this case, as expected, we have a deformation along the um, curved or the edges of the MD, which is a stress concentration uh, feature in any component that we had uh, similar features. And then the other thing is we didn't expect is that we have a high strain in, in, in a little bit away from the MD. Along the bend, away from, a little bit away from the um, the bend line. So, in order to put this into context, we also um, try to compare these results to the regular sheet metal forming, and then having different MDs with different shapes, and see um, what are the results. So, the bending force also uh, have been affected. The spring back in this case is, was introduced, so MD14. Bending without a die actually resulted with, um, you know, almost um, similar to the MD with 243, which is this one, I believe. Yes. And the bending force reduced, and the stress is also increased. So you can see that MD14 resulted with the higher force uh, um, stresses compared to the MD243. So the essence of this results is to evaluate each of the MDs, and then based on the optimization um, of the MD or the effect of the MD on the final part, we need to pick one for the structural um, optimization. So if we looked at the case where we imitate the MDs, uh, the OSM bending, so this is was done only for regular sheet metal forming. So we don't have an MDs, and we had actually better results than the whipping die. Um, case for regular sheet metal forming. So, so in, uh, to put it into context, we did a simulation, basically a finite element analysis for the components. And there's a three things we, we, we can do to, in order to evaluate these. So the finite element analysis, the experiment, and the empirical modeling. So the reason where we do empirical modeling, and if you took any um, sheet metal course, maybe in, in manufacturing course, is that you can see that most of this science has been developed, so you can calculate the bending force, you can calculate the stress, you can calculate where is actually the bending line location. Um, all of these empirical models have been developed with experiment and finite element analysis over time. So what we try to do is if we can characterize the MDs in terms of uh, static known uh, parameters that these characteristics will be in every MD, right? So we cannot go and keep doing the MD simulation every time we do MD new shape. So we need a standardized way of expressing these MDs regardless of the shape or pattern. So these, these parameters will be the same in each MD. And then based on that, we, we try to simulate uh, based on the area and volume and bend, resulting bending force and the um, width um, um, uh, of the part of the sheet of the, actually the strap is millimeter, yeah. So it's T, so what will be the coefficient, um, the resulting coefficient, and the, 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 the fascinating thing is that for different MDs, we can end up with this fixed coefficient, regardless of the, um, the, um, the area and the volume and the resulting bending force. So if the thickness is the same, we can end up with the same coefficient, empirical coefficient, we can basically include in the bending force without, with MD, to um, conclude what will be the bending force resulted from the non-regular um, force formula that we have. And then the, the other question that leads us to, to this ongoing research is that how much energy I'm saving? Like if this is a, a very important information for, the, for, for us to evaluate if this process is actually feasible in a manufacturing context or no. So the initial studies of what we did is 
Um, we compared the cradle to gate, to gate energy um, stamping for stamping path and then tried to do the same for the OSM. So for stamping, it was straightforward. That you have literature, you have studies, you have tables, you have even softwares that can tell you how much um, you will be producing or uh, consuming uh, in energy for stainless steel and aluminum sheets. However, um, when we look at those, um, it's a little bit tricky because there's two manufacturing processes actually involved. Um, so there's the cutting and there's the bending. Um, so in, in this case, we're just looking um, at, for example, if we, let's evaluate this, the embedded en energy will be the same in both um, the, when processing energy. The reason for that is the raw material is the same, right? So it's sheet metal in both cases. The only difference we anticipate will be in the manufacturing energy, which is in case this is a case of stamping, and then in this case is, let's say, laser cut, cutting and bending. And then the other one will be in the final assembly um, energy. So in this case, there is no any differences in assembly energy. So there is no any assembly for this part. So we, we, we just looked at the manufacturing energy. And then if we looked at the stainless steel aluminum, and then for both paths, you can see that there's a huge reduction in the required manufacturing force. And we're not looking at the die. We're just looking at the tonnage of the press that uh, applies to the part to be deformed. And then this is actually the bending force um, for the different lengths in the um, um, CO2 creating um, laser cutting of the MDs. So you can see the initial studies uh, from the literature. Um, we didn't do any experiment yet, but it, there's a huge reduction. So there's a, a great potential um, to reduce the number of energy, manufacturing energy spent in this um, components. So to, to give you an idea, where are we? Um, so this is actually the, I try to be systematic and put them into a graph so I, I know where I am and what I want to, to, to go. So basically, um, we're done with objective two. So objective two is all done. Uh, we're still in the task one and objective one, which is understand and model the mechanical performance of uh, some structure. And hopefully, a um, couple of years from here, we reach the final, which is the comprehend the combined effect of the material discontinuities parameters and the topological reconfigurability on the mechanical loading of uh, some structure. And we'll be able to say, OK, um, with the variation of flat patterns, variation of MDs, and the structure itself, we can tell which design will be optimized. And as an assistant professor, I have to thank my students and um, um, undergrad students who volunteer and work in my lab. Um, so I have two PhD students and actually a lot of, um, and one ma master's students and a lot of bachelor's students who um, work and contributed to some essence in the, in the lab. And that's concludes my pre presentation. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
one part that you generate versus the same part and controlling the variation this way. Because you have mathematical models, it seems to me using these models, you have to build some sort of a, some uncertainties in order to control variation. Yes, there is there, indeed there will be a lot of variations in the process, especially with the creation of the MD, and then the, the sheet metal itself, right? So the sheet metal itself actually is not consistent; has some different drawing uh, specifications in it. However, we didn't reach this 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 um, step in the research yet. So, but it will be in a future scope of this because currently the only variation we're looking at is the different features of the MD. So these are controlled, right? So we can tell which one we can control, which one we can avoid. However, the uncontrolled variations re resulting from the, the process in inherent parameters itself yet. Yeah, no, we didn't discuss it. Any Yes, yeah. So the partial cut will be similar to the stamping. So the stamping deforms a little bit of the material. So we don't need, we do strain hardening to the material along the bend line. However, in the partial cut, we remove the strain hardening, right? So it's a, a one step better than, than the stamping. So now we focus on the laser cutting only, the full laser cutting, because this is the weakest. So if, if it worked for the weakest um, setup of the MDs, then we can go comfortably to the high level. Any questions? Is, your, is the um, surface of your MDs important, or do you just uh, uh, not care because you weld everything? Uh, no, it's not um, important yet. Mm -hmm. However, in the stress concentration, mm -hmm. it will be more important um, to look at. But it, in an aesthetic <coughs> way, it's not. So, yeah. Any more? I'm just wondering, maybe I'm looking at it in a more simplistic way, but why can't you put all of the parts that you, you're, you're trying to come up with and fold in, in a virtual world and then control the trajectories of your tooling, mm -hmm. you know, uh, by, by putting this in a virtual world, all the parts you want, and then control the trajectory of your tooling in order to, you know, come up with the, you know, folding of parts so it's going to be like in a feedback type of, so you could control all the variation, you don't have to go through what you're going through. Do, do you but how to, the, the problem is that how to create these variations. So if I have a 3D structure without known MDs, okay. I don't know the bending lines. The structures would be in a virtual world. Okay. Like, this is, a, I see it as a, as a very interesting concept for deep learning using neural network deep learning. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, nowadays they could do amazing things. So they could learn the three parts and generate the trajectories and you could control the tooling. All of the parts, 3D parts, could be a store, you could, you know, and they could learn this and then generate these trajectories so you could control your tooling. Why can't it be done that way? Well, you, then, you don't, then you avoid all of the stuff that you have to do, you know, that you're doing, you know, you're optimizing and all of the things that you're almost doing manually, you, you will avoid it that way. I, I don't know, maybe, uh, well, tooling for what? The, 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 let me just put tooling for bending or tooling for to create the laser cut? The both, both. Whatever that you're doing, you could have it stored and then you could generate these trajectories for different tooling. If you have different tooling, you can have different virtual trajectory mm -hmm. generation and do, do it. And, and th this way, actually, you could control your variation of your... So, I... I well, yeah, I mean... Um, uh, yeah, let me just put it this. Maybe it's a, a thing I need to look at more for the future. But the, the, maybe the only thing is that I look at it is that when I go from the two, 3D to 2D, there's no any initial trajectory known. So I'm not doing this manually, actually. So all of these algorithms, once developed, you just feed them a CAD model, do the STL uh, model, and that's it. And then the output will be flat patterns. So there is no initial. So for example, if I want to re... The, let me just go back here. So let me, if I want to recreate some parts that's similar to the one, that's, that's actually a good point. I can use this. Since already I have an initial input, an initial um, solution to my problem, I can input it and go from there so I don't need to go through the whole process again. Yeah, here you could, you could teach the 
you could have those, the, the parts that you're making, like 1 and 2 in 3D, in a neural network, train neural network, and you, can, you don't really worry about the 2Ds at all. You can then, they learn that what the parts you want, mm -hmm. and what, what the trajectories they want to generate in order to generate those the parts that you're after okay. in 3D. Well, I, to be honest, I didn't explore the new neural network um, uh, uh, application. But if, if I can apply the geometrical information, like, you know, the thicknesses right. and the dimension, right. this is feasible. That yes, I'm this not, is. I'm not sure. Yeah, so this sure, is. This is not my area. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any last one? Right. You've thought about this a lot for, for automotive. I, I guess you must have some experience in the automotive field. And I wonder. Uh, where else do you see it applying? Well, the automotive is actually the hard, hardest application to oh. satisfy, right? So it's not just a... But the other thing is, the funny thing is if you can create metal furniture out of it, sure. like the, yeah. the discs and surfaces that's already in, 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 um, in offices, right. and then you can reduce inventory significantly in this because you can ship the customers a flat pattern and then they can fold it and once they want and put screws in it. And actually, there's one company who commercialized this for furniture. So they can ship you, but it's not for metal, it's for polymer. So they can ship you flat uh, um, seat, chair, and you fold it. And then you carry it wherever you want. And this is good for like events. So you, they can have a small truck with like 200 seats inside. So because it's folded, yeah. Yeah, and they, they have now, they produce even tables in like this shape, so even for formal talks, you can have like plastic folded ones. Right. Yeah. All right, I think we'll close up.